Please welcome Keith Tuffley, CEO and Managing Partner of The B-Team. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to day two of this inspiring, informative and incredibly visually exciting Our Ocean Conference. I'm not sure about you, but I'm absolutely loving this room and loving the room outside. Congratulations to all the organisers. And thank you to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and uh, His Serene Highness, uh, Prince Albert of Monaco, for the messages uh, to all of us here today. Both of them have been personally committed to the causes of sustainability and conservation for m much of their lives. Now, I'm truly honoured and humbled to be asked to moderate this panel of world-leading philanthropists, all of whom are committing so much of their energy their business skills and their personal funds to the health of our oceans. Yesterday we heard from some inspiring speakers such as Roz, Jeff and Nanoa, who are helping to make more visible to us what is under the surface of the oceans and what is out there in the vast wilderness of the high seas. By bringing into our living rooms and into our hearts, our minds and our souls the true beauty and the complexity, the true value and the real dependency of humans on the health of the ocean. We also heard about the significant role that governments are playing around the world to solve the challenges and the problems. With this panel, we will discuss the critical role played by philanthropy in preserving and restoring the ocean. And one of the key issues we need to address is how do we scale up these investments. The proportion of total philanthropy dollars that is invested in conservation is actually very small and some estimates put it at around 1%. And then the proportion of the total conservation dollars allocated to the oceans is even smaller. So our oceans, which as we heard time and time again yesterday, are the lifeblood for humans and for life on Earth, and yet is at serious risk of systemic failure, is only receiving currently a small proportion of total philanthropy investments. Worse still, are the investment levels from the non, for the for-profit private sector. The ocean is largely out of sight, out of mind for most companies, other than those that are directly and immediately dependent on, on the ocean, such as fisheries. And yet the health of the ocean is so critical to the health of the private sector in so many ways and across so many sectors. For too long, the private sector has treated the ocean as a dumping ground for its pollution, as an infinite source for seafood and as the greatest absorber for both carbon dioxide and global warming. And we're finally coming to realise that the ocean, despite its vastness, can actually fail. And if it fails, business globally will fail. And this is why the B team was formed. It's a group of progressive business leaders and civil society CEOs who wish to help change the role of business for the world from one that is currently focused narrowly on short-term financial only and, sh and shareholder focused to one that has a broader responsibility and recognises the critical role that business can and indeed must play if we are to solve the systemic challenges of the 21st century. We need to encourage businesses to take responsibility for their impacts across the full supply chains and their full consumer chain. Rather than saying it's someone else's responsibility, because they have outsourced the problem back upstream or downstream. We need to encourage businesses to measure their true impacts on the planet and on our ocean and to responsibly report these impacts to their shareholders so that investors can be fully informed of the corporate risks and to also disclose them to the consumers so that we all can make fully informed purchasing decisions. Ultimately, the negative externalities generated by business need to be internalised by business. Indeed, we need to make the ocean the business of business. But this will not be possible without philanthropy. We simply cannot unlock the trillions in the private sector and the capital markets without the great leadership and visionary and caring philanthropists such as those you're about to hear from. Business needs philanthropy. It needs it to provide the seed capital for new investments, to provide the expertise and insights that many businesses don't have in this area, and to encourage the boldness and the ambition that is so desperately needed.
Philanthropic investment is fundamental to saving and restoring our ocean. And one of its biggest impacts will be by collaborating and partnering with the private sector to create the opportunities and the environment for business, investors and the financial markets to be able to shift billions towards the health and the prosperity of our ocean. So I now have the great pleasure to introduce each of the panellists to the stage. None of them actually need much of an introduction given the extraordinary leadership in the world of philanthropy, conservation, oceans and business. And I encourage you to read their detailed bios uh, on the Our Ocean website. Firstly, I introduce Rob Walton. Rob is a board member of the Walton Family Foundation and chairs the Environment Program Committee and its work on ocean and river uh, conservation. He is a member of the Board of Directors of Walmart and served as the chairman from 1992 to 2015. Rob. <laughs> Julie Packard is a trustee of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, a major funder of oceans and climate solutions. She is founding executive director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium and chairs the board of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Welcome, Julie. <laughs> Ted Waite retired as the chairman and uh, CEO of Gateway in 2004. He has since dedicated his life to philanthropy. And in the last seven years, the Waite Foundation has committed over $70 million to various ocean initiatives and the Waite Institute is directly engaged helping coastal communities. Welcome, Ted. <laughs> Christian Parker is a member of the Oak Foundation's Board of Trustees. Since its inception in 1998, he has overseen the Oak Foundation's Environment Program, which dedicates the majority of its resources to fight climate change and protecting the oceans. Christian. And finally, Anissa Camadoli Costa is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Tiffany & Co and also serves as the Chairman and President of the Tiffany & Co Foundation. The Tiffany & Co Foundation has been funding coral and marine conservation since it was established in 2000. I'm also proud to say that Tiffany is a member of the Founders Circle of the B Team and we all appreciate their wonderful support. Anissa. Thank you, Keith. Distinguished guests, fellow panelists, and participants, it's an honor to be here this morning. I'd like to start by extending a special thanks to Secretary Kerry for his leadership and vision in hosting this important gathering. It's wonderful to see the momentum growing for this annual event, and I'm pleased to join a community whose passion for and commitment to the ocean is helping us to protect this critical natural resource. As chairman and president of the Tiffany & Company Foundation, and as Chief Sustainability Officer at Tiffany & Company, I am proud to be part of an organization that understands the importance of this issue. This is our ocean, and its fate represents our collective future. At Tiffany & Company, we believe that it is our moral duty to sustain the natural environment. And through our foundation, we seek to preserve the world's most treasured seascapes and landscapes. That's why we made the decision many years ago to fund coral and marine conservation. To date, we've invested nearly $15 million in organizations and projects that advance ocean protection and conservation and raise awareness about the plight of coral. I want to take this opportunity to share with you some exciting news. The Tiffany Foundation has made a commitment to support the Realize the 2020 Goal effort in the Bahamas a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy, the Bahamas National Trust, and the Bahamas Reef Environment Educational Foundation. This three-year effort aims to conserve and manage at least 20% of this region's marine and coastal environment by 2020, doubling its protected areas. Working with a funders collaborative called Oceans 5, we're proud to commit 1.2 million to this critical work over the next three years. This announcement is exciting, I think, because it demonstrates the power of collaboration. Philanthropy, of course, is not about one group or organization working independently. It's about working collaboratively, putting the issues first and generating a multiplier effect with our grant-making dollars. Our foundation is proud to partner with others to expand the impact of our grant-making efforts. We recognize that by aligning goals, we can make more of a difference together than any one organization can alone. Already, these collaborative efforts, including Oceans 5 and Pew's Global Ocean Legacy Program, 
have achieved many successes. In fact, both groups were instrumental in supporting work to expand the Pacific Remote Islands Marine Monument, Monument and Papahanaumokuakea Kea Marine National Monument in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. We commend President Obama and the administration for making this designation and creating the world's largest marine protected area. But having a large impact on the ocean doesn't mean you have to be part of a large organization. Everyone can and should contribute to its protection. Every funder, large or small, every company regardless of size or industry, every government and every citizen. As someone with roles at both a foundation and a company, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the important opportunity for business to take action. A truly global, diverse set of industries has both an impact on and an opportunity to protect the ocean, from shipping to food and agriculture to tourism and travel to the jewelry and home decor industries. Companies that impact the ocean directly can address issues through their supply chains and operations other companies can use the power of their brand to inspire more action. The bottom line is this, we need more companies to take action and speak out to protect the ocean. I wanna leave you with one final thought. This is our ocean and it's our future. I urge you to think about what you can do individually and what we can do collectively to protect it, making sure to collaborate across sectors, including government, civil society, business, and of course, philanthropy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And again, thank you to President Obama, Secretary Kerry, Foreign Minister Munoz, and all of the world leaders who made such remarkable commitments to protect the world's oceans. We also want to thank the leaders who, who have agreed to maintain this annual event in future years. We appreciate all of your leadership and pledge to do what we can to help our ocean. Thank you. Th thank, thank you, Anissa, and uh, having first come across Anissa many years ago with the, uh, involving the Great Barrier Reef Foundation in Australia, and you can see some of these magnificent photographs giving you a feel about the Great Barrier Reef, but uh, as was mentioned by Jeff yesterday, over summer, southern summer, um, the world lost 22% of the Great Barrier Reef. That's about half the size of England. Um, it was extraordinary uh, when you put it in those contexts, and we see this incredible biodiversity, but... Uh, Anise has been one of the great uh, leaders from the corporate sector, and I think is a wonderful role model for others. Um, Christian, join the stage, please. Thank you. Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is great pleasure to be with you here today to participate in this session on ocean philanthropy. As you can imagine, it is a topic that is very close to my heart and takes up a considerable amount of my thoughts. I grew up in landlocked Switzerland and yet I fell in love with the oceans at an early age. It was my dream to become a marine biologist. My first job was in Hawaii studying nudibranchs. At night, though, I would sneak off to my second job, reading current proposals for, the, for my family's foundation, the Oak Foundation. Our vision Next slide, please. Oh, never mind. Um, when I first started in philanthropy, our primary focus was controlling overfishing, which was driving the collapse in the ocean ecosystems. We knew then that overfishing and the practices of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing fleets were scourges that robbed the world's populations of critical food source and that upset the natural balance of nature. Next slide, please. Now, nearly 20 years later, all of us can take pride in many significant accomplishments throughout the world. Next slide. Our collective success includes greater surveillance of fishing fleets and enforcement rules, stricter use of scientific evidence in policy setting, and marine protected areas, including significant no-take zones. The United States has been working hard in these areas with Presidential Task Force on IUU this year announcing its set of important measures to prohibit illegal fish entering your market. This is a significant step forward and you can, you're to be congratulated. However, overfishing is still occurring throughout the world and is now compounded, compounded by threats that risk undermining everything that we have accomplished so far. Climate change 
is the primary threat, of course. Record-breaking temperatures around the world are driving unprecedented sea ice loss in the Arctic and coral bleaching and die-offs. The clarion call of the ecosystem collapse is loud and, and urgent. If we do not manage to rapidly reduce global CO2 and methane emissions in the next few years, the oceans will become warmer and more acidic with irreversible consequences. Garbage dumps. We are also using the, our oceans as a garbage dump, not just for CO2, but also for chemical agricultural runoff, industrial effluents, municipal wastes, and plastics. Humanity is creating oceans' death by a thousand cuts. Three years ago, the Oak Foundation started thinking seriously about plastics pollution. We realized it was a significant threat to the oceans with broader consequences for public health and the environment. About 8 million tons of plastic waste enter the oceans every year. 8 million tons, all of which remains persistent in the environment for hundreds of years. And the quantity being produced by the plastics industry is rising exponentially. So, according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, by 2050, there could be the same amount of plastic in the oceans as fish. Plastics are also toxic. They both contribute to toxins to the marine environment and concentrate through absorption. Thus, they deliver high amounts of chemicals to the ocean life that consumes them. We now have robust evidence that plastic is not just in the ecosystem. It is increasingly a dominant feature of the ecosystem. I'm sure in reality we all share the same vision of a future for a healthy ocean abundant in life. If we're going to create that future, we all need to get busy. Civil society, the scientific community, industry, governments, philanthropy need to work to help this make this happen. We need to build resilience for all aspects of ocean health. The Oak Foundation has committed a total of 60 million to the ocean conservation over the next three years. This commitment supports projects to end overfishing, protect small-scale fisheries, and reduce plastic pollution. We also provide 40 million per year to our climate change program. All of these investments benefit the oceans. And I can announce that the Oak Foundation has issued over two million over three years to create a pool fund to support international campaigns to reduce plastic pollution. We commit spending an additional 15 to 20 million over the next five years on plastics. We challenge others to do the same. The urgency of this issue becomes clearer every day. So many thanks for your time today. I'm very much looking forward to the presentations of my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. I think uh, we're, uh, I mean, the awareness of plastics in the oceans has become a, such a dominant theme in the last five or six years. Um, I mean, who would have thought the statistic of by 2050, the weight, total weight of plastics in the ocean approximating the total fish in the oceans? An extraordinary, and even scarier is how small the plastics become as they start to deteriorate and the impact it has on the entire food chain. So the leadership you're showing there, Christian, with the Oak Foundation is tremendous and desperately needed. Um, I'd like now to welcome uh, Ted to the stage. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Keith, and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it is so good to be here today. Uh, and I also personally want to thank Secretary Kerry for really ushering in a new era in ocean conservation. I think he has single-handedly done more than any person I can think of to advance the cause of ocean conservation around the world. And I think he needs a huge round of applause. I mean, it was just, I remember just six years ago when I first got into ocean conservation, I convened a group of people at, uh, at the National Geographic Society just a few blocks from here. And I was young and dumb and new to ocean conservation. I said, I'm going to get everybody together and we're going to solve all the problems. And I broke out a whiteboard and we're going to list what we're going to do and we're going to create more marine protected areas around the world. And I launched into this discussion and I realized people talked about what is a marine protected area? Do we really need marine protected areas? But we should do fisheries reform. All of these types of things. We don't even know how many marine protected areas were, there, there were. And so out of that came at least one thing was MPA Atlas that MCI and the team there has done such a great job. It's great to see people using that. But and at that point, less than 1% of the ocean was protected. Now, 3%, we're moving, and we're mo moving forward. But back then, the process for ocean conservation was a lot different. It would start with 
an NGO. They would find a beautiful place or some species that needed to be protected. Um, and then they would rush around to the philanthropist and try and raise a bunch of money. And then they would take that money and they're going to go convince the government that they needed to change. This was an incredibly inefficient process and wasted a lot of time and a lot of money, a lot of energy, and didn't yield results for years and years. Secretary, K and this was really an NGO-driven process. Now, Secretary Kerry has, with his leadership, is really bringing in the era of a government-led process. Because at the end of the day, it's governments that have to do this. They have to own this. And only through their leadership and his inspiration to inspire other countries around the world, can we achieve the goals that we all know we need to, that we all know we need to achieve. Um, but there's a few obstacles that we have in order to achieve those goals. Governments can't do it alone. We all have to do it together. So what do they need? So we're gonna commit now to do one thing to help governments. They need a clearinghouse. Wouldn't it be great if there was a place where governments could go to get the help they needed? Governments that have committed to, to, to to increasing their marine protection. A clearinghouse, a place where they can go, and then we can look at that and create the group that is gonna really drive this change. The philanthropic dollars, the NGOs that bring the technical skills to do the mapping, to do the zoning, to do the scientific, the scientific planning, and to create a sustainable economic plan. And that's what also is needed, because at the end of the day, as Keith said previously, the philanthropic group here, we provide the seed capital. When you're doing ocean conservation like this, there's a dip. There has to be an investment that gets made. The philanthropic dollars can help fill that gap initially, but at the end, it has to be sustainably. It has to be sustainable. So what if we had a consulting group that could offer pro bono consulting services to governments? So we commit to do everything we can, working with people here, to create that group, to, pr to really create a sustainable economic plan for these, for these governments around the world. They need the help, and we can do it if we, if we work together. Because the blue economy is great. The funding mechanisms are there. But if we work together, we can create an era of blue prosperity, which takes it to the next level. So we all know MPAs work. What else are we going to commit to? We're going to commit to focusing on MPAs. Why? Because they're the best tool that we have in ocean conservation. We know scientifically, and as Dr. Enrique Sala said, MPAs are the, the thing that, that restores the ocean quickly and creates more prosperity. So the Waite Foundation has continued to do everything we can to support MPAs around the world. Over the last seven years, we've committed $70 million. Over the next few years, we're going to commit more than that to continue to work on, MP on MPAs around the world. And I'd like to, to encourage the other foundations to not forget about MPAs, because they are the cornerstone of ocean conservation. Um, and working together, philanthropists, business, governments, NGOs, we can continue to increase that. And we can take it, we took it from 1% to 3% over the last years. Now we're gonna take it from 3% to 10% over the next years. But we're only gonna do that if we work together. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ted, and I think you can all see the, the combination of energy, uh, ideas, tangible ideas, by the way, um, and business skills uh, that actually the conservation movement and the ocean so desperately need. Uh, congratulations, Ted, for the leadership you're showing. It really is inspiring uh, and uh, uh, an example for many, many others. So thank you, Ted. And uh, Julie, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. start, of, of course, by equity, ec echoing what's been said about Senator and Secretary Kerry's incredible leadership over all these years. It's really quite remarkable. It's so inspiring to be here in the room with you all and with these great folks up here on the stage that are showing such leadership in terms of private support to advance conservation. So I'm here to share a few words about the Dave and Lucille Packard Foundation's investment in a future for our ocean and the people that depend on the ocean. So our foundation's development was driven by my father, David Packard's values, um, invest in people, take risks, support science-based solutions to global and societal problems. And 
focus on the future was really his, his biggest idea. So in its early years, our foundation, when it came to environmental work, we mainly focused on land-based work. But other, um, over time, we realized something was missing. Uh, that something was what I like to call the other three quarters of the planet, uh, the part where the vast majority of life on Earth resides, uh, the part that enables life, in fact, to exist here on our planet, the ocean. We are inspired by the Bonneray Bay, where we lived and worked. And we decided to begin with a place for learning about the ocean. We created a new kind of aquarium, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, with a new kind of mission to inspire conservation of the ocean. So far, the aquarium's introduced over 60 million people to what the ocean is really about and the incredible marine life that lives there around the idea, really, of inspiration and learning, because that's, that's where it starts. People like the kids here in this uh, image from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, one of my favorites. We hope these kids and others will grow up as ocean literate, informed, and responsible citizens of a country that has profound, profound impact on the use of global resources. Through working with the aquarium, though, my father became struck by the lack of technology available to understand ocean science and especially the very poor understanding of the deep sea. To meet this need, a few years after the aquarium was founded, we created another institution, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or Mbari. Mbari's technology and discoveries today are front and center in terms of advancing technology and our understanding of human impact on the sea. Things like how do ocean plastics move through the food web, or how can we create better measurement devices to measure and understand ocean acidification. So today, the Monterey Bay is a national marine sanctuary and it's really a global center for ocean science and research and, um, and innovation, new thinking, to understand the living ocean and inform a course for the future. Indeed, Monterey Bay now is one of the most studied pieces of ocean on the planet and is a big piece of California's continued leadership really as an incubator for environmental solutions. But it wasn't always this way. A hundred years ago, as many people in the room may be aware, Monterey Bay had a different story. It was a major whaling center. Sea otters had been hunted to near extinction by fur traders. And the sardine fishery was just ramping up to become one of history's most famous tales of fishery collapse. As we look across the globe, we see so many stories like Monterey Bay's sad tale of the demise of its thriving ecosystem but not enough stories of the recovery, the recovery that we know the ocean's capable of and that we all have the capacity to make happen. We can change that. So it took the combined energies of a lot of players to create a new vision for Monterey Bay. And the elements for success are the same all over the world. Education, science, economic security and prosperity, marine protected areas, very essential, and effective resource management policies by governments. So the Packard Foundation made our first ocean-related grant in 1968, and working with our colleagues in philanthropy, our long-term investment in people and institutions, I like to think, has really transformed not only what we know about the ocean, but also how we interact with it. And of course, we've all evolved our thinking along the way, along with our grantees and partners and collaborators. This year, our board approved a new 15-year commitment to ocean grant making and a framework to continue to advance our vision of a future where the biodiversity, the resilience, and the abundance of ocean life, ocean life and coastal and marine ecosystems is rebounding and providing increasing benefits for people. MPA and effective policy are, effective, are essential elements of the solutions. But so is working with the global seafood business enterprise to change how seafood is fished and farmed. This is the greatest immediate impact on the ocean and its biodiversity that we can change. And it's degrading our oceans every second of every day. The problems caused by overfishing, bycatch, and habitat damage have solutions. We've seen how well-managed fisheries and aquaculture are achievable. And our foundation also has a major grant program to mitigate climate change impacts, again, together with some of my colleagues here on, uh, on the stage. Of course, that remains the greatest long-term threat to not only ocean health, but uh, the future of humanity, and we'll be directing more of our attention to the ocean and climate connection in the future. 
Coupled with our seafood and policies work, we've also had a long-term commitment to demonstrating success in the geographies, uh, many of whom we've heard from today with remarkable commitments that are so inspiring, um, and, and uh, a commitment to helping countries promote effective policy in key fishing nations. In the next five years, our foundation is going to be focusing on six countries. Some of them are long-term partners, some are new areas of focus. The United States, Mexico, Chile, Indonesia, China, and Japan. Time is of the essence, as everyone here in this room is aware. If we wait, the problems we're working on will only become more difficult and expensive to solve. We need to step up our collaboration by government, business, academia, and communities. Private philanthropies, like many here in the room, can play a critical role. We can take more risks, we can provide proofs of concept, serve as models, be conveners and collaborators, provide resources for experimentation and innovation in ways perhaps that other sectors cannot. We can pave the way for business, government, and community action. Working together, we're convinced significant progress can be made in the next 15 years. So toward the goal of the Our Ocean Conference, I'm very pleased to announce the Packard Foundation is making a commitment to provide $550 million over the next five years to support ocean conservation and science and to partner with those working to advance our collective progress toward our shared goal of achieving a future in which the ocean and people survive and thrive. My hope is that one day soon the transformative story of Monterey Bay becomes a common theme emerging from the many places that we work. People have created the challenges we face, and I know we have the ingenuity and the drive to overcome them. I've seen what can happen when they do. Thank you very much. That was $550 million, in case you didn't hear it. That's extraordinary, Julie. Congratulations. In, in addition to the dollars, I think the other key message there was about the opportunity and the positive, uh, the creation of a positive opportunity to restore the oceans, uh, that the oceans can bounce back, and it provides a, an optimistic and positive message for people worldwide that we can actually restore and we can actually improve, uh, provided we invest. Once again, thank you, Julie. And lastly, Rob, welcome to the stage. Thank you all. At the Walton Family Foundation, we believe that conservation solutions that make economic sense stand the test of time. The mission of our environmental program is to improve lives and secure healthy ocean and river ecosystems by aligning environmental, social, and economic interests. At this year's Our Ocean Conference, I'm going to start with our commitment here, but at this year's Our Ocean uh, Conference, Walton Family Foundation is pleased to announce a five-year, $250 million commitment to support ocean conservation and sustainable fisheries in Indonesia and the Americas, the United States, Mexico, Chile, and Peru, as well as the re restoration of the coastal Gulf of Mexico. Fishing... <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Fishing can become the sustainable success story of the 21st century. If properly managed, fisheries will provide increased income and stability for coastal communities and industry as well as improved ocean health. Over the next five years, our foundation will be working in Indonesia and the Americas. Uh, you'll hear a similar focus area to what uh, the Packard Foundation is doing internationally. We'll be using a coordinated approach with grantees and partners to implement the following six strategies. Develop the scientific information and tools needed to enable better fisheries management. Empower local fishermen and communities through catch shares that provide secure tenure rights. Safeguard critical fish habitats with marine protected areas and other spatial management tools. Strengthen the capacity of fishermen, governments, and civil society to rebuild fisheries. Promote fisheries policies and programs that create positive incentives to encourage responsible fishing. And harness the market for sustainable seafood to support healthy 
fisheries practices. Implementing these six strategies in a coordinated fashion will result in a legal and economic framework that creates strong incentives to develop and maintain healthy fisheries. There's momentum for this type of coordinated approach that expands the network of players in fisheries issues, coordinates around shared goals, and shares the tools and approaches that work. The opportunity we see is in creating new partnerships among conservation organizations, businesses, and communities to restore the health of oceans through sustainable fisheries. The end result will be healthy ecosystems that support healthy fish populations, making fishing communities and industry more economically and socially secure. We also see opportunity in U.S. coastal restoration. Billions of dollars are moving into the Gulf of Mexico from the Deepwater Horizon settlement. All told, there will be almost $15 billion over the next 15 years available for restoration. This region is vital to the nation's economy. It's home to $34 billion tourism industry and 40% of all seafood harvested in the lower 48 states comes from the Gulf. Our aim in the Gulf is to ensure that the available restoration funds are invested wisely so that restoration activities are undertaken at the appropriate scale to address the historic loss of wetlands, oyster reefs, and other coastal systems that the region needs to stay strong and resilient. The decisions we make over these next years for the climate, the ocean and coast, the air we breathe, and the water we drink will determine what kind of world we leave for our children and grandchildren. We know the problems and we know the solutions. Our challenge and the opportunity is to come together as individuals, organizations, and governments to take the action necessary to leave a healthy environment for the future. Thank you very much. Well, Rob, for you to say that we know the solutions really sticks to me because we do know the solutions. We don't need the commitment, and uh, that is a great message. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for your leadership and your family's leadership. Um, I'd like you all now to thank once again the panellists uh, with the pause. Thank you. I, I must admit, um, the role we were on with these financial commitments tempted me to suggest we put a few more seats on the stage so we can get a few more people up there with uh, further commitments. But we will do it from the audience. And uh, I now have the great pleasure to turn to some members of the audience um, to provide some commitments. I, I'll just ask you to try and keep it to two minutes because we are uh, of limited time. Um, but uh, I believe we please just start with Her Excellency uh, Anna Paula Vitorino, Minister of the Sea for Portugal. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the United States Administration, especially the Secretary of State John Kerry, to, prepare, to organize this uh, uh, fantastic and prestigious conference. And uh, it, it's also a pleasure to meet again with some of the participants in the Oceans meeting in Lisbon last June. A dynamic and sustainable ocean economy is a critical feature to ensure a balanced prosperity of humankind. In fact, the vast oceans that make the most part of our planet is a key source of food, energy, minerals, health, leisure, and transport upon which hundreds of millions of people depend. However, this enormous potential does not come without risks. Uh, which are very complex and diverse. Ocean health is the most critical of all. Unhealthy oceans are caused by over-exploitation of marine resources, pollution, rising sea temperatures and levels, ocean acidification and loss of biodiversity. How can governments, entrepreneurs, innovators, consumers, environmentalists, scientists and citizens of the world win this challenge. We believe that the answer lies in the disruptive sustainable innovation that flourish in the emerging ocean-based in industries. They offer vast opportunities for addressing many of the big economic, social and environmental challenges 
face humankind in the, in the years ahead. It is also, this is the reason why the Ministry of the Sea of Portugal committed to create a $30 million blue fund, an instrument dedicated to support the development of blue economy based on innovative and ocean-friendly techniques, processes, and business models that is able to connect and match with other private and international investment funds. Reminding that all this only makes sense if we preserve the different ecosystems that compose the global resource that is the ocean, and because we must fight for sustainability and social equity, I would like to announce that Portugal commits to become a safe ocean network partner, participating this way in a concerted effort to better combat illegal fishing agreeing to participate in projects and sharing information in this contest and proactively look for opportunities to collaborate. I conclude my intervention inviting you all to go to Portugal next year to the Oceans Meeting 2017 that will take place on the 7th and 8th of September and which will focus on oceans and human health. I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Dennis Takahashi Kelso of the Marine Conservation Initiative at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Thank you. And thanks to all of the nations represented here. It's gratifying and also encouraging to see the commitment to shared action on behalf of our ocean. In that regard, I'd like to extend special thanks to President Obama and Secretary Kerry, as well as Ambassador David Bolton for their leadership on the Arctic Council and for Arctic Ocean Conservation more broadly. Secretary Kerry uh, serves now as the chair of the Arctic Council and uh, he and his colleagues have laid a sound foundation for the Arctic Council to move forward with a conservation agenda as Finland assumes the chair in 2017. Thank you. Here at home, we talked yesterday about the President's exceptional designations of protected areas, and we thank him for that. But I don't want to forget to mention our thanks for his actions to establish a national ocean policy, and as part of that, putting in motion a regional planning effort that is yielding already plans for the Northeast and for the Mid-Atlantic regions here in the United States. This is an extraordinary accomplishment and it represents an additional step that supplements um, and builds on, actually, protected areas so that we have a more comprehensive approach to ocean management and really a leap ahead in policy for the ocean in the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, I'd like to announce that as our contribution to this effort, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation projects a commitment of $220 million over the next five years for ocean science and for other ocean conservation work. We look forward to collaborating with you and with other colleagues <clears throat> in really striving and achieving a shared ocean future. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. And next is Tony Banbury of Vulcan Incorporated. Um, good morning. I'm privileged to represent Paul Allen's to lead his philanthropic efforts. I'd like to start off uh, by thanking Secretary Kerry, Under Secretary Novelli, and all the staff of the State Department and other parts of the U.S. government who have done such a great job with uh, not just putting this conference together, but extracting a lot of commitments that otherwise would have been made. And it's a great example of diplomacy. Um, Paul Allen's top philanthropic priorities are oceans, climate, and wildlife conservation. He's a uh, 
committed ocean explorer and scientist, and one of his top priorities within oceans is combating illegal fishing. We all know the important role that marine protected areas play in, in that, but as we go from 3% to 10% and on to 30%, we're going to need to find new ways to assist with the management of those marine protected areas uh, so that the, the, the wildlife within them, the fishes, fish within them, can be properly protected. It's not just a, a, a lines on a map. Paul is committed to using his very significant technological and aerospace capabilities to pr help provide domain awareness for the proper management of marine protected areas and with an initial commitment of $3.7 million uh, to do machine learning to better understand what, the, what satellite imagery can tell us at a much lower cost. And as that technology is developed, the, uh, he's committed to investing much more in this area so that the countries of the world, enforcement agencies of the, the world, will have much better understanding of what's happening in these marine protected areas so that we can keep them safe for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And now Dr. Robert Cook uh, of the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust. Thank you. Our congratulations and appreciation to Secretary Kerry, Under Secretary Novelli, the State Department staff, and all the many participants and contributors to this very important and successful gathering. The Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust Conservation Program works to resolve environmental threats through an approach that seeks to ensure the well-being of local communities while sustaining natural resources and protecting biodiversity. The Helmsley Charitable Trust intends to provide marine-oriented grants totaling $6 million in fiscal year 2017. The grant making is being provided to multiple non-governmental organizations working in the areas of coastal community-based conservation, locally managed marine areas, sustainable fisheries, species conservation, creating and maintaining marine protected areas, and ocean conservation. Helmsley is also delighted to be part of the new funders collaborative that was just launched, the Global Partnership for Sharks and Rays. Thank you very much. And Paul Bungie from, of the XPRIZE. Thank you very much, and I want to thank Secretary Kerry and the entire State Department for organizing this and appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of the XPRIZE Foundation, where we at the XPRIZE are committed to building a bridge to abundance for all. And when we say all, we mean all creatures, be they human, non-human, on land or in sea. And as such, three years ago, we made a commitment to launching five Ocean X Prizes before 2020 in goals of helping bring about a world with healthy, valued, and understood oceans. But in order to have healthy oceans, we recognize that people must value them. And in order to value oceans, we must understand them and have the knowledge that's at that base. And it is with that intent that we recently announced the $7 million Shell Ocean Discovery X Prize, a global competition inspiring innovators from anywhere to develop technology that can increase the autonomy, the scale, the speed, and the accuracy and resolution of our ability to understand and discover what's happening beneath our waves. This is a competition open to innovators from anywhere around the world right now as we speak, and it will help increase the things that we need to map out areas for marine protection, to understand where vulnerable parts of the shallow and deep seas are, and to build a robust understanding of the one planet in the ecosystem that we still retain the least knowledge about because it's mostly covered in water. It is, with, it is with this that I encourage all of you to join us in se setting ourselves on a, path, a pace to build out that understanding associated with this competition, and then join us as we continue our development of two more X Prizes, which will be launched by 2020 in goal of helping out issues associated with plastics, fishing, ocean weather, nutritious abundance for all, and energy from the sea that can help offset some of the greatest threats that the ocean is facing from issues associated with climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now Dr. Douglas McCauley of the Marine Science Institute at the University of California at Santa Barbara on behalf of Mark and Lynn Benioff. Thank you. We've uh, together had some very productive conversation about breaking down barriers between the communities of NGOs and those in government, I want to highlight another barrier that we may want to address, and that's with our partners, Gross and Change, and universities. 
I'm a professor of marine science at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and myself and my colleagues in marine science are often bothered by the fact that our research sometimes feels like it's simply contributing additional paragraphs to what feels like an increasingly well-resolved obituary for the oceans. The, today, I'm very excited to announce a gift from Mark and Lynn Benioff, which uh, is in the order of $10 million to the University of California, Santa Barbara, which is about allowing, helping us, empowering us to do more than this. The Benioff Ocean Initiative, which we established today, is inspired by Mark's philosophy that the business of business is not just business. It's about making change in our world. We ask, with the Benioff Ocean Initiative, could the business of marine science be more than just marine science? Just as a medical school on a university that studies cancer really needs to apply the, uh, the science of cancer to, to cure cancer, Perhaps we're doing a disservice if ocean research centers are studying ocean illness but not applying our science directly to fixing that illness. Our agenda for the Benioff Ocean Initiative will be completely set by uh, the world, where I'm exciting today, announcing today a very exciting invitation to crowdsource ideas for our agenda. What we'll do is we'll take a selection of ideas that come in through this campaign, we'll invest uh, just over a million dollars on each idea, and then we'll collect a group of global science experts to study the problem, design a fix, and then put that fix into motion, into life. The Ideas Campaign I want to emphasize is a completely open invitation. I would like to uh, encourage all of you to submit an idea that you want marine science to make an investment in directly to us. Tweet an idea, an ocean problem in your own ocean backyard to the Benioff Ocean Initiative. Jump on the website of the Benioff Ocean Initiative and submit an idea there. I'm delighted to launch this initiative today in your company, as all of us know the imperative for making change in the oceans, and all of us also know that there may be some great value in re-engineering the very process by which that change happens. Thank you, Mark and Lynn, for your generosity. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Douglas. And uh, now Ms. Maria Damanaki of the Nature Conservancy. I would like to thank you all for your generosity and for the excellent contributions we have heard until now. But I'm here to tell you that in Nature Conservancy, we believe that the amount of money coming into ocean conservation, conservation in general for the planet, but especially in ocean conservation, is wholly inadequate to deal with the challenge posed by climate change and the soaring of blue economy. So we believe that we have to find ways to mobilize the private corporation, the businesses, the markets that profit from ocean resources to contribute to their use of nature. I'm here to tell you that the Nature Conservancy is going to undertake a new initiative to increase donations that are coming to us from you, from the ocean contributors, over the next four years through innovative financing tools and public-private partnerships. And as, a, as an example, we have just finalized the deal of 28 million with the government of Seychelles to exchange part of the country's debt for marine planning, management, and protection of their great, great exclusive economic zone. In the next four years, we are planning to scale debt swaps with at least six more countries, small island countries, but big ocean states. We are also planning to issue the first blue bond connected with integrated ocean management during the next 20 months. For all these aims, we are going to partner with public authorities, the World Bank, the Red Cross, private banks, the insurance industry, the fisheries associations, aquaculture, food chain suppliers, and of course with friends from other NGOs. We hope we can bring on board up to $150 million to target sustainable management of 4 million square kilometers of ocean, including mangrove and wetland restoration, full protection of 1.4 million square kilometers of ocean, 
the conservation of important habitats and species such as corals. We are going to put 30% of the world corals under protection. We are going to create a network for corals in up to 90% of the countries that have corals along the planet. And I think that with your support, we can open the window for more initiatives to leverage up the money coming from the donations. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And now Lance Morgan of the Marine Conservation Institute. Good morning. I would also like to add my uh, thanks and appreciation to Secretary Kerry and the staff here who put on a fabulous Our Oceans meeting. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Global Ocean Refuge System this morning. I'm pleased to announce that the Global Ocean Refuge System, which we call Glories, um, which is to honor the glories of the sea, is going to, in the next year, inaugurate the first 10 Global Ocean Refuges. We have heard many leaders speak to the urgency of protecting our oceans. The Global Ocean Refuge System is an initiative to establish a worldwide system of strongly protected areas covering 30% covering of each bioregion of the ocean. This target is consistent with the most current sci science and a recent resolution of the IUCN World Conservation Congress encouraging 30% protection for our oceans. Marine protected areas are a critical conservation tool. Strong protection ensures that these areas provide the greatest possible benefits to marine habitats, the wildlife they support, and people. Working with marine scientists, we developed clear and robust scientific criteria for global ocean refuges. Glories uses a geographic framework to ensure that all regions are protected from the tropical seas to the polar oceans and from coastlines to the deepest canyons. The system is, <coughs> is based on science and provides a framework that will lead to a more resilient ocean, able to help withstand the dramatic changes underway from accelerating climate change. Importantly, Glories is a collaborative framework to support all marine protected area efforts, like the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval, LEED Certification, Quality Stars from Yelp, and Sustainable Seafood Ratings, among others. The Glory status awarded to MPAs will give decision makers and funders an economic, an economic incentive to steer designations of MPAs towards meaningful places with effective management and good enforcement. It will also serve as a benchmark for improving paper parks. We believe Glories will provide incentives to do more. Global ocean refuges will be recognized for their commitment to protecting places where marine life can thrive. I encourage you to visit our website at globaloceanrefuge.org or join us by, visiting, by meeting with me and helping us to build the global ocean refuge system. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. <laughs> And next is Peter Seligman of, the, uh, of, of Conservation International. And Peter, I can see you've got a team with you right there. Yes, we are here as collaborators. Uh, my name is Peter Seligman of Conservation International. Good morning. Uh, and I extend also my thanks and appreciation to the Secretary and the State Department, all of you, for the extraordinary commitments that you're making. I'm standing here with our partners, with Naoki Ishii of the GEF, with Maria Dominaki of the Nature Conservancy, and Carter Roberts of World Wildlife Fund, uh, with Rob Walton of uh, the Walton Family Foundation, uh, to, uh, to announce uh, uh, that the images that are behind us of the Bird's Head uh, Peninsula in West Papua, Indonesia, uh, will be uh, seared forever in permanent protection through a, a joint effort to create the Blue Abadi Fund. Uh, this is a Blue Abadi Fund for sustained conservation of the West Papua seascape. In Bahasa, Abadi means timeless, enduring, and forever. And that really is the, the purpose of our engagement in West Papua. And for 12 years, this partnership has collaborated with other, over 30 other institutions, over 70, 70 donors, the government of Indonesia to collaborate with local communities to ensure that the West Papua uh, uh, Bird's Head Peninsula would be secure forever. I'd like to recognize uh, the Walton Family Foundation and the GEF for making the initial important contributions to launch the Blue Body Fund. 
Uh, and I'd also like to recognize Julie Packard and the Packard Foundation for making the initial contribution to the bird's head and to Anissa Costa of Tiffany Company for actually providing the resources to make this visible to the rest of the world through virtual reality. The government of Indonesia, the government of West Papua have been essential, but the underlying success really depends upon the local communities that have made a commitment for their lives and their families. And I think that's one thing that I really want to underscore for everybody here. No matter what we do, it's the local communities who really have the enlightened self-interest at heart to actually make certain that we are successful in the long run. Finally, it's very important to recognize Ibu Susi, the Minister of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of the Republic of Indonesia for the firm dedication and extraordinarily strong leadership that she has demonstrated in combating illegal fishing. So thank you to the partners, and I'd like to now have Naoko Ishi make some comments. Naoko. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pete. Um, I am totally excited uh, to be here with partners. And I'd like to announce that the GF's commitment, GF will provide two million US dollars as a seed funding to help capitalize uh, this fund. This fund is so unique, and this creates this an investment partnership among the government, that the uh, philanthropist, and NGOs, and uh, uh, multilateral institutions like us. This breakthrough uh, fund is a new way to its it demonstrates the power of the partnership, uh, multi-stakeholder partnership, to leverage the finance to the ocean, which is our global environmental commons. Thank you so much. And, and lastly, we have His Excellency, Mr. Fleming Umich Sengabar, Ministry, uh, Minister of the Ministry for Natural Resources, Environment and Tourism of the Republic of Palau. Two years ago, in this very room, our President, His Excellency Tommy Ida Mungsao Jr. stood on that stage and announced Palau's commitment to create a marine protected area consisting of our entire exclusive economic zone. Last year in Chile, our Vice President reiterated that commitment to the world. Today, it gives me great pleasure to return to Washington and announced that last year, on October 28, our president signed that the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, effectively creating the sixth largest marine protected area at the time, and in terms of proportion to the country size, the largest. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary is one of the world's most ambitious ocean conservation initiatives to date, and is aimed at not only protecting Palau's marine resources, but also at protecting the world tuna stocks. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary covers our entire exclusive economic zone and includes a no-take zone of over 500,000 square kilometer, covering 80% of Palau's exclusive economic zone, in which no fishing or any extraction of natural resources will occur as well as a domestic fishing zone covering approximately 20% of Palau's exclusive economic zone in which sustainable traditional and domestic fishing activities will be allowed to provide fish solely for Palau's food security and domestic market. Palau is now working with other government and NGO partners to implement this monumental initiative and we are looking forward to working with the United States newest program to combat IUU fishing, the Secure Ocean Network. Thank you, Secretary Kerry, and all those here who have provided us tools to make our commitment a success. Thank you very much. Thank well, th thank you again to all those who have made the, uh, the, the commitments and the uh, speeches today. I, I must admit, I've never actually followed two princes on stage before. Um, I've never had the opportunity of hosting and uh, moderating such a high quality and impressive group of people um, in business, in philanthropy. I've never had the opportunity of actually thanking um, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry for his extraordinary leadership for, for creating this, but also hopefully creating something that really is actually a movement. Um, and I, I would personally like to thank uh, 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 John Kerry for that. But lastly, I have never been on a panel which has involved over a billion dollars of commitments 
uh, to the environment and to the ocean specifically. And I'd like you all now to thank the panellists for the extraordinary and those who have announced it. It's an, ex an, extraordinary, an extraordinary commitment all around. Um, I'm afraid we've eaten into your coffee break. I do apologise for that. Um, I believe... Uh, uh, Senator Kerry, you... Oh, OK. a chance to uh, summarize a little bit uh, later this afternoon. I look forward to catching up to everybody then so we can sort of put the meat of this together. But uh, I, I think you'll agree with me. We're making enormous progress. And it's exciting. It's fun. Anyway, thank you. See you in a bit.